So without further ado, I'd like to move straight into the programme for today. And we start with the James Dungey Lecture for 2017, one of our uh, named lectures. And it will be given by Professor Chris Owen from the Mullard Space Science Lab of UCL. And the title is Manifestations of the J Dungey Reconnection Process Within the Heliosphere. Chris. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the RAS for awarding me this, this honour of giving the, what I think, if I counted correctly, is the fifth James Dungey Lecture, and I think that, that makes it the, uh, the most junior, the, 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 the newest of the named lectures, uh, and in fact I think that means also that many people in the audience may remember James Dungey. Uh, he died uh, just over two years ago, uh, and this is a picture of Jim, uh, taken in 1985. <coughs> Uh, which was the year he retired, and in fact, what you can see holding up there, this is now rather a famous picture of him. What you see is uh, the, his retirement present from the, the group at Imperial, uh, which uh, was a model of his magnetosphere as, as a wind vane. Now, this occurred the year that I joined the, the, uh, the group, in fact, the summer before I joined the group. I don't think there was a, a cause and effect in that, but Jim had actually retired. But that's not to say that he hadn't already had uh, a, a bit of an impact on my psyche, because my, my first memory of Jim was actually more or less 35 years ago last month, when in the first coursework that I went to as a, as a young, wet behind the ears, 18-year-old in Imperial, uh, the first academic that came up to me and scared the life out of me, he turned out to be Jim Dungey, and it was such a traumatic experience. I remember the question that he came and asked me about. It was about how fast you have to walk in the rain to minimise the amount of uh, or how wet you get. And as I learned later, Jim sat down with me for quite a long time. We produced reams and reams of mathematics, and I think at the end we produced the, uh, the obvious example that the faster you walk, the less rain, uh, less rain gets on your head. Um, but that was my first encounter with, with Jim. My other favourite story is, is uh, sort of illustrated in the little cartoon that's, that's going on there. This was some years later, even after he retired. Many of you know that Jim used to come to the, the RAS meetings. Uh, and I remember one particular meeting, and it was over, I think, in the, in the Antiquities uh, Lecture Theatre. And uh, Jim was trying to explain the principle of, of particle, charged particle motion around a current sheet in a reconnection site, which has become known as sort of spy, or is known as Spicer orbits. So what's, what's drawn here is a slightly more modern version of, of, uh, of how that works, with particles coming in and turning around in the current sheet and coming back out again. Now in those days, Jim only had, uh, didn't, you know, before laser pointers and things like that, and Jim had the great big stick that they had in the theatre there. And it was about three metres long, and I just remember, I had this mental picture of him, he was waving it down, here comes the electron, and it whoosh, and everybody in the front row had to duck <laughs> as this stick went straight across the front before the, the, uh, the bamboo end particle came out of the other end. So, so I, ha I have fond memories of Jim, and it's, it's uh, something of one of those quirks of, of life uh, that, uh, that I find myself standing here now to deliver a lecture, uh, that, that is a lecture in the series that's named after him. Um, so, the, uh, the Dungey reconnection process, uh, this is the, 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 the model that, that, that Jim, if you like, this is his legacy to, the, to, to uh, space plasma phys physics. Uh, here is the picture that he published in, in 1961, and what Jim did was to take the, the, the emerging ideas of this concept called magnetic reconnection and apply it to the... To the uh, um, to the situation of the Earth and the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, and so the Earth's field would be dipole, but Jim was the first really to point out that if, if this process called magnetic reconnection occurred between the Earth's dipole field and the, a field line that, uh, that, that emanates from outside the, the, that region, in, in this case it would be the solar wind, that merging of these field lines would result in a change in topology here so that the dipole field line would become what we call open, and that the forces that then act on that would take these field lines over the poles and add them to the night side of the tail, uh, whereupon they would meet field line, the part of the field line coming un under the south pole of the, of the Earth. They would meet and then they could reconnect again here, uh, and that would then create a cycle that had a return flow. And so what that did was basically start the field of magnetospheric dynamics, 
um, which becomes rather important these days in considering things like um, space weather and the impact of how the sun and the, the energy that comes from the sun in the form of the solar wind, uh, which is uh, an energy flux that's of order 10 to 13 joules per second if you um, calculate that over, the, over a cross-section of, a t of, a, uh, of, of the average magnetosphere. Um, and that, we know now, is strongly modulated by the direction of the magnetic field that comes from the sun in, in the interplanetary magnetic field. Um, I need to be careful about that one because I think IMF mean, meant something else to everybody that was at the meeting in this room earlier today, is that right? So, um, so the IMF is, in this case, is the interplanetary magnetic field. Um, and so uh, given that the, 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 the reconnection is uh, controlled by the direction of the two fields, the more anti-parallel the fields, the better, this became... Um, part of the, of, of the basis for understanding the dynamics of, of the magnetosphere. And most magnetospheric physicists refer to this uh, as the Dungey cycle. And we see examples of people quoting the Dungey cycle at the Earth and the other planets uh, and elsewhere um, around. So, um, so much of our understanding of the, the dynamics of the Earth and the magnetospheres is based on this, this original model. So what I want to do really is, is to take that sort of the concept and how it was applied and to sort of do a little bit of a, of a tour, saying, okay, you know, can, I, can I see evidence or, or, or can, I, can I present to you some evidence and some manifestations of, of these, this, these reconnection processes occurring around the Earth, around its magnetosphere, in other magnetospheres, um, a little bit in other places, although I... Uh, I, I maybe can't be as ambitious as I wanted to be when I first put the title down. But anyway, <coughs> so we're going to look at that. Um, so if I zoom in on one of these boxes, then this is sort of the simple picture of what's going on in, in magne magnetic reconnection. <coughs> so first of all, um, we have to have fields that, uh, that, uh, that have a shear to them. So in this case, they're simply drawn as oppositely directed. Here's the field pointing downwards on this side and upwards on this side. That creates uh, a current sheet, and if the current sheet uh, <coughs> is, uh, becomes thin enough and there is an electric field, which I've drawn here, which um, <coughs> causes the plasma and the field on either side to, to, to drift in towards the centre of this current sheet, then there is a magic process that occurs in what's known as the diffusion region um, that allows the, uh, the, 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 the two fields to, to interact and to break the connection and reconnect on either side. So we start from the field lines that are, that are anti-parallel and separate, and what we end up generating is a sort of V-shaped field line um, up and down on both sides. Uh, and the liberation of the magnetic energy that goes with that is such that we generate a fast plasma outflow jet as we liberate the magnetic energy that's uh, in the inflow regions into a jet along this current sheet. Um, and the other important thing to note here that we'll refer to is that also once you've done this, then you've now allowed an intermixing of the plasma populations from either side of the current sheet, whereas previously they would have been separated um, without the, the, this process occurring. So, um, as I say, I'm going to run through and, and, and talk about some of the, the observational evidence and try to sort of explain in, in, in a simple way what is going on. Um, so what I'm going to talk about really is uh, what we see in those outflow regions that, that, that I described before and how that varies and how you can understand that in terms of, of, uh, of, of, of some simple physics. Um, the second bullet here, sorry if this appears, I, I read this earlier and thought it seems a little bit apologetic. I didn't mean to do that. What I, what I think I've done is, okay, I think you can, these days, um, people run computer simulations of, of magnetic reconnection and many other processes, and I think that you can uh, you can you can get very you can almost simulate anything you like given the complexity of the equations and the the detailed boundary conditions. Um, but that's not really what I do. So what I want to try to do is to explain um, some of the observations that we see uh, of uh, reconnection outflows in a much simpler framework. So first of all, I'm going to just set that up. Um, and hopefully it won't be too, too, too simple, but it, I, I accept that it's nothing like the, the complex simulations that are kind of state-of-the-art these days. The other sort of apology that I that seem to have written here is that uh, when, we, when, we, when we go looking for evidence of these things, 
uh, I need to show you data that basically comes along as what we call time series data. So it's lots of wiggly lines, which uh, I know a lot of, you know, sometimes people think it's a bit challenging. So I'll, I'll try to guide you through carefully when we've got these wiggly lines on the screen, uh, and also to try to do a little bit of cartoon physics that goes with it. But I, I appreciate that uh, it's, it, it, it perhaps needs a, a, sometimes needs a special eye to understand it, so I apologise in advance if that's, that's the case. Okay, so what is my simple little framework for understanding these things? Well, it's got just simply to do with the balance of, of forces on, on, on a reconnected field line. So what I've drawn here in this cartoon uh, is simply a field line that has undergone reconnection at some point, so it's bent. Um, the two sides of the current sheet have been... Uh, become connected uh, and what I want to consider first is let's let's if you like ride along with this field line let's go in the rest frame of this reconnected field line and that means that uh, there, there's no electric field here it's a, it's a time steady situation as far as this field line is concerned um, but the bend in the field line implies that uh, that it, it still has a tendency to try to straighten so there's a magnetic tension that that is associated with the field line uh, and that tension has to be balanced somehow. And the way that that is balanced is by the inflow of particles going up and down this field line in this, in this frame. Now, I've just drawn a couple of patches of particles. Obviously, the plasma should exist everywhere here. So this is a continuous process of particles um, going in and out along these field lines. Uh, and so because there's no electric field, these particles are just going to go in and come out at, at the same speed. Um, <coughs> And so we can understand what, that, what, what they must do. Um, but that means that the, the source of balancing this magnetic tension and keeping this, uh, this magnetic field steady must just come from the change of momentum as the particles go around, go around the bend, yeah, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so we, you can calculate mathematically what that, how, how that works. And what you find then if you do the maths and I'm studiously avoiding doing any, any mass or shiny equations in, in this talk, uh, is that you find that you, the, the particles in this, in this framework must move at something uh, equivalent to the, to the Alphane speed, which is a characteristic speed fixed by the magnetic field and the density of, of the, the outside plasma. Um, so we understand they, they, they just move around the... the, the uh, around the field line based on the, on the field strength and the, and, and the density. What happens then if I move um, to a, a field line which is more like what we, we probably would see, which is the rest frame of the plasma itself. And so now the field line is going to move. And the field line, if I'm in the rest frame of the plasma, the field line must move with the alphane speed. So <clears throat> what I expect to see now is the field line coming across the page, traveling at the, alpha, uh, at the alphane speed. And the, the particles that I was monitoring before have to stay stuck on the, uh, on the field line, so they slowly drift inwards. Um, and when they hit the current sheet, they turn around, and because we've made a frame transformation, what they end up doing is moving out along the field line at about twice the alphane speed. Okay, so very simply, um, given this sort of understanding of what, what's going to happen on a, on a reconnected field line, I expect the plasma and the magnetic field to interact in su such that the field line recoils at something like an alphane speed, VA, <coughs> and the jet that comes out from this, this um, scenario is going to come out something like twice the alphane speed. Now, my, the limits of my PowerPoint um, animation were such that I couldn't draw the bottom half of this and get it to work with the particles going in and out. So, um, you have to imagine that the top half is also reproduced on the bottom half of this little fi figure. So, um, going back then to sort of considering that the, 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 the plasma is continuous, not just a bunch of particles as I was drawn there, what you then find is that you set up a structure of these um, <coughs> reconnected field lines that look something like this. So here are a succession of field lines that have been reconnected and created, one after another, one, two, three, four, five, this is the the most recently reconnected field lines. Those are busy recoiling along the current sheet at the alphane speed. The plasma drifts slowly inwards, and then the plasma is accelerated and drifts outwards um, in a beam along, roughly along the field uh, that is about twice the alphane speed. Uh, and you can also do some um, other simple calculations and work out that because of the, because the outflow here is about twice the, uh, 
the outflow of the plasma is about twice the outflow of the, uh, or the recoil speed of the field. The plasma fills about half of the wedge of reconnected field. Um, and any faster particles, so for example, if you uh, consider what electrons may be doing, now electrons are light enough that they don't change the force balance equation, it's the, it's the ions that, that, that are uh, doing the change of momentum. So electrons may or may not be doing whatever they like, but if they, they're generally much faster, so the electrons um, generally then stream out ahead of the ions, or may stream out ahead of the ions, and so they can fill up the entire reconnected field wedge. Should just say though that uh, so, th so this is sort of so this is the the, uh, the situation in the uh, in a frame where that where we've uh, assumed that the, the the plasma in the exterior region uh, has uh, has no no motion. It's the it's the plasma rest frame if you like. But in fact, uh, you can pretty much do this in any frame you like with any kind of flow um, uh, of the of the exterior plasma. Uh, and in fact, you can also do this by saying, well, okay, I don't need the plasma on one side of the, uh, of the reconnection current sheet to be the same density as the other. So this is just an example of calculation where one side has a quarter of the density and there is a flow uh, in, the out, in the outflow here but not in here. All the numbers that are written in here are actually um, units of, of VA. And you can do the same calculation based on some assumption about how the, 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 the particles are reflected or... or transmitted through the current sheet. And so you can come up with a, uh, with a, um, a structure for the, for, for the reconnection jet, which looks something like that in this example. But um, what you see is that there's differences between one side, so the jet heading to the right here, and the jet heading to the left. Um, this one is thicker than this one, because the, 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 the D parameters that I showed before are changed. This is slightly slower than this one. Um, but by and large, what you're looking for then is something where the outflows are of order the alphane speed to, to twice the alphane speed, and the recoil speeds of the field lines are, are half to, to one and a half times the, the alphane speed. So you can apply this general principle to a number of, of situations, uh, and some of them we'll look at going forward. So that means that we can go looking for this reconnection process uh, anywhere there is uh, a shear in the, in the magnetic field, so in other words, where there's a current sheet, uh, and we would need to go and try and see if we can spot the reconnection by finding um, outflows that are of order one to twice the alphane speed. And here's some typical numbers for the region um, around geospace. So in the solar wind, you might expect the alphane speed to be something of order 50, 40 or 50 kilometres per second. Higher in the magnetosheath, which is the region behind the, the, the bow shock that stands upstream of the Earth. The Earth is shown here in this, uh, in this figure. Um, and then the, inside the magnetosphere, so the cavity that is formed by um, the, uh, the Earth's magnetic field, uh, you find in the day side uh, and in the, in the tail lobes and the tail mantle that maybe that's something like 200 kilometers per second. In the central region here, it's maybe about 50. So you have current sheets in the middle of the tail where the, the fields have been added by the Dungy cycle, and they, so they could be reconnection here, reconnection on the magnetopause where there's a current sheet. And actually what is missing in here as well, because this figure doesn't have the IMF in it, uh, is uh, the, the, the interplanetary magnetic field. You can have current sheets occur in there. And it turns out, actually, that if you're going to go and look for these kind of simple structures, simple jet structure, then looking at the uh, current sheet in the solar wind is actually quite advantageous because the solar wind itself is moving very fast across a spacecraft, and so it goes, you just have a, a one clean cut through it, whereas all these other structures are, are slightly jelly-like and wobble and flap up and down, so, so trying to sort of see a, a signature in, in, uh, against the sort of the general motion of the magnetosphere can be quite tricky. So here is an example then of uh, reconnection occurring in, in, in what looks like a near steady state uh, and at large scale. Um, this is an example that was presented in a Nature paper in, in 2006. And what we see here is our, our first set of, of wiggly lines, but there are uh, data from three spacecraft plotted here. This is the ACE spacecraft that lives, uh, that orbits the, the L1 point upstream of the Earth. So this 
in this diagram here that tries to show where the spacecraft are located. The uh, Earth is here, ACE is upstream at, um, uh, at 240 odd Earth radii, the Sun is at the top over here. Um, so ACE cluster um, orbits around the Earth, so cluster is drawn here, so in this case it was just upstream from the Earth. And wind is another spacecraft out in the solar wind. In this case, um, it was uh, some 300 Earth radii um, to the, to the uh, dawn side of, of the Earth. But what you see in each case, in the top case here, is, is traces of the magnetic field, three vectors of the magnetic field. And you see a change uh, in the field direction that's associated with a current sheet at ACE. And as that current sheet passes ACE, you see a deflection in the three components of the velocity vector in here. And that velocity vector, when you look at the, the deflection from the, the background field, is of order the expected alpha in speed. Sometime later, and this is something like uh, three and a half hours, so something like an hour later, the, that current sheet travels with the solar wind and arrives at Earth. And again, you can see the same kind of signature, a change in the magnetic field showing the current sheet has arrived and a spike in the velocity that shows you that the alpha in speed, or there's a spike there at the alpha in speed. And then again, sometime later, uh, it appears at wind. And the interpretation of all of that is that then one of these um, reconnected field wedges that I described earlier has come um, past the, the, over the spacecraft location um, with the neutral line, the, the, the point where the, the reconnection is actually taking place being some way above the, uh, uh, the, the plane that the spacecraft are occupying. Okay, and you, <clears throat> uh, from this you can see then, okay, that this, this seems to be pretty steady. The signatures lasted two or three hours and the separation of the spacecraft suggested that this was going on across a very large um, portion of the solar wind, so something like 400 Earth radii. Um, was the extent of this reconnection in the solar wind. So, so this is, if you like, the classic example of steady-state reconnection going on in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a, a reconnected field wedge that is convected past the spacecraft um, sequentially over the, over the time span of about four hours. Now, going back into the magnetosphere, um, this is kind of a diagram that, if you like, is, is perhaps a little bit more of a realistic um, representation of the, of the magnetosphere than the original Dungey um, 61 cartoon, but it represents the same kind of thing that the, the reconnection that occurs on the day side with the solar wind field gets pulled over the poles and, and added to the tail. And in this case, this was drawn in, uh, thinking that the sort of the steady state picture of the magnetosphere would be such that the, the reconnection site in the tail would be something of order 100 <coughs> uh, Earth radii down tail. And in principle, you might think that this was a, an easy place to go and find signatures of, of, uh, of steady state um, <coughs> reconnection. But as I said before, this whole thing flaps up and down, so, that, so you never really stay long enough in any of these regions. You, a spacecraft in this region sort of creates a, a, a trajectory that is, is up and down as the solar wind buffets the, the, the whole magnetosphere. So it, it's, not that tri it's not that easy to to come up and say here is a classic example of the tail, despite the fact actually this is the, the configuration which has, almost always has, anti-parallel fields. So it should be the, the configuration where finding reconnection is, is closest to the sort of the, the, the original classic picture. Um, but anyway, that's also uh, ignores another complication of the reconnection process in the magnetosphere, and that is that it seems that it's not actually time steady anyway, and that Although the Dungey process adds flux from the day side, there isn't a uh, repeating or, or, or a, a matching process on the night side that returns the flux um, instantaneously at the same rate. And so what we, we have in the, in the Earth's tail is something called a magnetospheric substorm. Now, the magnetospheric substorm in itself is, is, is a uh, rather controversial topic in, and, um, of which reconnection is part of the story. But there are many different ideas about whether reconnection is the cause of a substorm or whether it is a consequence of a substorm. So I don't really want to get into to, to, to talking in depth about, about that in this talk. What I want to do is say, OK, what is, you know, what, what, what is the consequence of, of reconnection when it does happen in a, um, a time-dependent uh, manner? <clears throat> 
And what you actually see then in the tail, I should say we're going to show two examples, one from a spacecraft that was actually sitting uh, in the lobe and one from a spacecraft that was, was much closer to this central um, plasma sheet that I've, I've shaded pink in here. So this is the example that you see in the lobe. And what you see uh, and what is um, uh, interpreted as being a signature of a pulse of reconnection is something called, in this case, a travelling compression region, and in the case over here, something called a plasmoid. And this is the spacecraft that is sitting comfortably out in, in, in the lobe, well away from the, the central region, well above where you might expect reconnection to go on. And what you see is a pulse that lasts here, oh, I can't, can't read the, the scale, it's, it's several, a couple of minutes pulse, but what you see is a, is a these, these three panels are, are, are time series of the magnetic field. So this is the total magnetic field. This is the magnetic field uh, that is normal to the reconnecting or the nominal reconnecting current sheet. And what you see is a uh, what's called a bipolar signature as the magnetic field points first northward uh, and then southward. And at the same time, you see a, a compression in the total field. So the, it seems like the field in this region has become squashed. If you go a little bit closer to the, um, to the plasma sheet, what you find is that you then see something that we, is called a plasmoid. Um, and oh, I should say that this, this signature has almost no signature in the particles with it, whereas this one, the, the, the key difference is that you do see um, particles. Now, what you have in this panel is, the, again, the three components of the magnetic field and the pressure uh, and the, the uh, velocity of, of the particles. <coughs> And the bottom panel here is a colour spectrogram that shows time against energy, and the colours then show you the number of particles that appeared at a, at a given energy in, in these kind of plots. So what you see here is that, again, the field has... Uh, the, the red component here is the, is the, the component normal to the, to the current sheet. Again, it shows a tendency to go positive and then negative, so it has a similar kind of bipolar signature. And what you see associated with that is an increase in the velocity, which in this case is in the, the, the negative direction, um, so it's away from the Earth. Um, and again, this is several hundred kilometres per second increase in the, in the velocity, so again, it's something that, that, that is um, equivalent to the, to the exterior alpha in speed. So this is, uh, again, interpreted as a signature of, of reconnection, um, what was interesting in this particular case, this comes from a, um, from a, a mission called, the, called Themis. In fact, both these examples are from a mission called Themis, which was a multi-spacecraft um, mission. And in this case, there were two separate probes um, slightly separated in the tail. So one of them was 60 Earth radii down the tail, and the other one was about 65. Uh, and so you see this, this plasmoid structure come past the spacecraft sequentially, so this one sees it first, and this one sees it a bit later. Um, I don't know how, how easy it is to see the time difference, but what you see here is actually between, in travelling the extra five Earth radii, the, uh, the, the plasmoid appears to have grown. The, the region where you see the, 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 the outflow jet, the enhanced flows here, uh, is, is bigger, uh, and the, the region where you can see these, this plasma is also somewhat, somewhat bigger, but it still has the the bipolar positive then negative magnetic field signature. So that's interesting. So, so what we need in our model then is uh, a way of uh, understanding what happens when you, when you put a pulse of reconnection. Uh, and here is a very simple um, idea that actually goes back to sort of things that, that uh, were in my thesis some uh, 25, 30 years ago. Um, and so if you just allow reconnection to go as a pulse, then what you do, again, this is showing half of the tail, um, so there's a, an equivalent mirror image underneath this, this part of the plot. What you do is to, to inject, um, or you reconnect field lines for a, a short period of time, and the field lines that have undergone the reconnection process are shown here in red, uh, and you fill those um, with a burst of accelerated particles that are accelerated as these field lines unravel as they go down the, the current sheet along this way. So this front, if you like, is the maximum extent of the outflow jets. We expect that to be travelling at something like twice the alpha in speed. And this front in the middle here is the, 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 the front that is the first reconnected field line. So these two structures 
head off down the tail at slightly different speeds. Now, there's a little bit of a problem here in that if you look at, at what that does to the outside field, if you, if you um, model the outside field as well, what you see is that um, what I get is a field deflection that in this case is just positive and, and that's all. So this doesn't actually reflect the true nature of the reconnection pulse that is coming out of the, of the reconnection in, in the tail as evidenced by those previous examples. And so what we've done then is to go back, um, and this is a, 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 one of my PhD students has done this, with uh, um, adding a, uh, a, a caveat to the stress balance conditions for the, for the plasma outflow region, that instead of just allowing the, the stress to be, to be uh, all in the, the change in momentum of the, uh, of the particle as they go around the reconnected field loop, we also allow some equipartition of the magnetic energy to go into plasma heating. And once you heat the plasma, then you naturally find that this structure is like a balloon. You're putting hot, pla oops, hot plasma in it, um, and it, it, it expands outwards. Uh, and so now you have to ad ad adjust the, the, uh, the stress balance condition to, to, to understand that the plasma is, is coming out um, with, some with some heat in it. Um, and you then have to also apply the correct vertical pressure balance, but it's still just a balance of forces, and you can self-consistently show that you end up with this bubble of hot plasma in the outflow, where again this, is going, this front is going something like twice the alphane speed, and the central part of it, and in fact the back part of it, are going at, at, at one times the alphane speed. And as you drape the field lines on now, you can see that we've created a, a kind of a drape signature and a compression in here. So this um, little model, although it's quite simple, it's just, uh, again, balancing the, balancing the forces, comes up with a, uh, uh, a, uh, a representation of, the, of the, 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 the gross features of the data that I showed you just now. In fact, you can go a little bit further than that, because one of the interesting things about this is that because the front of the plasma is traveling at a different speed um, from the front of the... Uh, the, uh, or the recon reconnected field lines, what you find is that the, 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 the front of the, the, the magnetic signature um, gets ahead of the back. So you, you actually end up with these signatures separating as, in time, uh, and the, um, the, uh, the, the size of the plasma, <coughs> the region occupied by the plasma, if you actually go through the, the structure itself, um, also gets bigger. Um, and so uh, I think you know, there, there might also be a simple explanation here for why, if you look at the statistics of, of plasmoids, um, you find that they are larger in the tail. And if you look at uh, uh, how often they're seen, you find that, you, that there are few of them observed in the tail. And I wonder whether if you kept pushing these two things apart, then you would cease to recognise that there was a bipolar signature there anymore, and maybe you wouldn't even define this signature as a, as a plasma. So... Um, possibly there's, you know, from this simple model, there's some, some explanations of some of the sort of the, the gross characteristics of plasmoids. Um, so continuing on on our little tour, I want to then move on to the, 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 the dayside um, current sheet. Uh, and here we see something um, that in, in sort of gross morphology is quite similar to the plasmoid, uh, except in, in, in this environment it's called a flux transfer event. Uh, and these are short pulses of, of, uh, of again, um, uh, magnetic field signature variation that tends to be positive and negative, or negative and positive. So the top panel here is the three components of the magnetic field. And so you can see there is a wiggle uh, associated with this. Again, uh, let's get this right, one of these panels, this panel here is the velocity. So again, you can see there are velocity increases. Um, to hundreds of kilometres per second. Um, so again, this is something that, that, that is sort of of order the, alpha, the expected alphane speed. And you can see injections of, of, uh, of, of plasma. Again, these are the spectrograms showing you how much plasma there is at a, at a given energy. Uh, and that's associated, again, with, a, in this case, a measured increase in, in the pressure as this thing um, comes past you. And this, I think, is some tens of seconds, which suggests that this structure is of order an, an Earth radii on, on, the, uh, on the, the day site boundary. Now, it's interesting to, to ask whether, having explained sort of the, the, the gross structure um, 
or, or, of this in, in the same way as, as perhaps, or, or at least one of the models explaining what these FTEs are has the same sort of growth structure that I showed you for, for the plasmoid. But the dayside environment is a lot more complex um, than the, 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 the simple anti-parallel fields that you get uh, in the tail. And indeed, what's shown here is, is um, some very old but still nonetheless valid um, hydrodynamic um, um, calculations for what the what the the flow and the and the density are in the the magnetosci. So in these diagrams here, the pink line is the bow shock, and the green line is supposed to be the outer boundary of the magnetosphere, and um, the magnetopause. Uh, and so what you see here is that the uh, as you go away from the subsolar point, <coughs> the numbers all increase, which show you that the the, the velocity um, increases. Uh, across the the, uh, the magnetopause, uh, I think this is the density. So the density uh, is very high here, and then reduces. And you can also use this. You can put in a, a magnetic field model, and you can show how the magnetic field um, must drape uh, across the uh, uh, across the dayside magnetopause as well. These two diagrams are, are then, or all these, the, the, yeah, these two diagrams are rotationally symmetric about about this axis. So you can <clears throat> um, use that information to try to define what the boundary conditions are on in in uh, in front of the magnetosphere. And so what's drawn here, um, sorry, it's a bit, bit crude, is the 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 direction, of a set of vectors for what the magnetos magnetospheric field um, looks like, projected onto um, the plane looking from the sun. So uh, this is the, if you like, the the, the magnetic cusps where the, the magnetic field um, comes out from the, uh, the Earth's surface and goes back down into the Earth's surface. The circle here is supposed to be where the terminator is, and the arrows are all the projection of the, of the interior magne <coughs> magnetic field. That's the magnetic field in this region. You can drape a magnetic field from um, the magnetic sheath across that, and you can then use this information to define what the magnetic sheath flow field um, might look like, and that means that you can then do that kind of stress balance calculation and say, well, if, the, if I'm going to now have um, a, a reconnected field line at any point on this plane, I know what the field is on one side, what the field is on the other side, I know what the, the flow on the outside is, and so that field line, once it's created, must move according to the, 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 the simple principle um, that I outlined before, that, the, that the, the balance of the magnetic tension that is created and the change in the plasma as it flows around the, the, through the current sheet um, must balance in the field line rest frame. Now, in this case, it becomes a complex um, 3D uh, problem, but it's just vector addition, uh, and that's something that Stan Cowley and I um, sorted out shortly after I finished my, my PhD. Um, and I'm not going to go into that because I'm, several people have told me that's the most complicated paper they've ever written, even though we use the word simple in the title. Um, <laughs> but just to show you how it, how it all works, because this, this kind of principle has been picked up um, first by uh, Bridget Cooling, uh, but used quite a lot in this case by, um, by Rob Fear um, to produce a model of how a flux tube if created somewhere on the, on the dayside magnetopause, how it would work, how it would move. So what you see here um, is a projection of a lightly neutral line running somewhere through near the subsolar point. You're, again, we're looking um, down from the sun at the sort of the bullet nose of the, of the ma magnetosphere. And the suggestion is that reconnection was occurring um, <clears throat> on a line that was tilted in this way somewhere near the subs going through the subsolar point. And if you do that, you can then predict, predict where the two connection points for the, for the reconnected field go, uh, and, you know, depending on where they were created. So the ones that, uh, that head vaguely northwards are shown in red, and the ones that head vaguely, the, the side that heads vaguely southward is shown in blue. Now, it turns out that um, you can, th this has been used on several occasions to look at, at uh, concurrent observations by various spacecraft, and in this case, the paper addressed um, cluster which was crossing the magnetopause um, south of the equator and on the, uh, the dawn side, and uh, in, uh, Themis again, which was crossing the, uh, the magnetopause um, near the equator but on the dusk side. 
Uh, and again, here's our, our wiggly little lines. Um, what is shown here, actually, this, this comes from a time when, when the, the five Themis spacecraft were all fairly close together. So there's actually one, two, three, four, um, five sets of, of magnetic field traces from five different probes, which are basically all around this region, uh, and three cases of, of the, the, the plasma spectrograms. But what I hope you can see is that in each case, there are examples where the fields show these wiggles, these positive-negative wiggles, um, slightly differently timed at each of the, of the five spacecraft. And because you've got these five points with the time, you can calculate how that structure must have moved. And indeed, in this case, this paper reports that this, the, the result of how this is moving is broadly consistent with the predictions of this relatively, relatively simple model. Moreover, you can do the same thing with cluster, which is down here. Um, this is slightly different, but the, uh, this is the, the, the plasma data from, from one, one of the spacecraft, but then the, 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 the normal component that, to the, the current sheet, the bit that should have the, the bipolar signature for each of the four spacecraft uh, is shown in four separate panels, black, red, green, and blue. Uh, and again, um, the resolution is not so, so good here, but there are, um, I hope you will agree, several examples where you can see the field flipping up and down. Um, and again, looking at the timing of the four spacecraft, which are all broadly in this region of the magnetosphere, again gives something consistent with the, the, the reconnected flux travelling um, southward and dawnward in this case, consistent with, again, with the predictions of, of this relatively simple model. Um, one thing that we did learn about this, and which <coughs> become relevant later, because I want to throw in... Uh, uh, a, a question to, uh, to people that maybe use Cassini data um, is that we found that um, if you try to move to a region where the, the magnetosheath flow has accelerated to the point that it goes higher than the alphane speed, then what, you need to, what that does to your solution is it blows both parts of the reconnection away in the same direction. So instead of two field lines recoiling away from a central neutral line, they both need to move in the same direction. So that seems to us to be a, a, a means of, um, <coughs> of saying that you can't really set up any kind of steady state reconnection. And that's reflected in this, this version of the figure where both sets of tracks from either side of the, uh, of the reconnection line, which is <coughs> placed here in this example, try to go northwards. And so there appears to be a sort of a natural... Um, restriction then to, to reconnection occurring in any kind of steady state in close to the, to, to the subsolar point, which for the Earth is where the flow is, the exterior flow in the magnetosheath is not very high. Okay, um, what am I doing for time? Um, so quickly a, a diversion then to say, well, do we see, do, do we see these effects that the, 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 the part, if you like, of the, of the Dungy cycle or, or the reconnection occurring in a magnetosphere uh, other um, planets, and the answer is, well, yes, we, yes, we do. Um, this is Mercury. Here is an FTE signature on the day side of Mercury. Uh, Mercury is a small magnetosphere, so in fact the FTE signature, the north-south signature here, is, lasts only about one second because of the travel times involved. There are plasmoids observed in, um, by messenger in the, uh, in the night side of Mercury. So here is um, just some examples. Again, if you look at the... Uh, the, 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 the signature that would be normal to, the, to a reconnecting current sheet, you can see um, north-south signatures occurring at Mercury. So Mercury behaves in much the same way uh, with these time-dependent signatures of reconnection. Um, and possibly Saturn does as well. Um, in fact, here is some examples of um, plasmoids and, and uh, TCRs that have been published by Catriona Jackman. Um, again, these are, I think these, are, these last a little bit longer now. Um, but really early on in the, in the uh, Cassini mission, uh, 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 my then PhD student and I tried to think to go and look for FTEs occurring on the day side of Saturn's magnetosphere. And although we found plasma data, um, I'll, to cut the story short, this plasma data appears to show that there is leakage of plasma across the magnetopause, we couldn't find any evidence of, of, of FTEs. Now, it turned out that some, some time later... Um, when there was much more Cassini data in the, in the bag, somebody went and, and to look for FTEs again and reported that there is no evidence of, of this phenomena, referring to FTEs, um, on the Saturn magnetopause, which 
begs the question, well, where has that, where has that gone? Now, it may, they may occur when the magnetosphere is compressed. There is some reports about that. But I would like to go back to my simple little picture of what, what is going on and say, well, let me unpick this picture of the, the dayside magnetopause, remove the, the field. Now, if I'm, if I'm going to talk about Saturn, I think I need to turn the, the field upside down. And the other big thing about Saturn that I have to put in the model is that there is a very strong co-rotation flow. So within the magnetosphere, the flow in, inside the magnetosphere itself is, is, is very fast. It's trying to rotate with the planet, which is, I, I believe, something like 12 hours rotation time. When I put in, I can put in a typical um, magnetosheath flow field again, but what I've got now is everywhere here there are shears in the flow that are likely to be in excess of the characteristic Alfang speed. So from this point of view, it seems that the Saturn magnetosphere may um, suppress the, uh, the occurrence of this reconnection because it can't be formed in a way that you can remove um, the, the reconnected field lines from both sides of the, of, the, uh, <clears throat> of the neutral line. So to my simple <coughs> mind, this means that the only real place where, the flow, where there aren't any shears in the flow or the shears in the flow are, are small enough that you might be able to create the reconnection would be in this region on the dusk equatorial flux. And I, I, my question to Cassini people, has anybody done a, a specific look test to see if they can see more reconnection signatures on, uh, in, in this region? Um, or is that really you know, something that, that, that Saturn doesn't support? Um, still got 10 minutes? Huh? Five, OK. Um, so. Let me just say that, that um, moving to small scale, um, if you do have shears, um, one of the things that we've, we've tried to test recently is that if you have these large shears, you might expect that instead of having this reconnection, that you would um, create Kelvin Helmholtz type waves. And there has been a suggestion that if these roll up into a sort of a non linear stage, as is shown here, they could disrupt the magnetic field even when it's in an orientation that doesn't allow reconnection to let reconnection um, occur. So the, the model, the, the Kelvin-Helmholtz field bends the fields until it gets to the point where small-scale reconnection could occur. Um, and we went and tested for that. And just to cut a long story short, since I'm running out of time, um, we did find that you can see very fast flows um, within these Kelvin-Helmholtz uh, regions. And they, they appear to be much faster than can be just passed to the, um, uh, to the plasma. Um, one thing that I should then say to, to advertise where the field is going now is to talk about the diffusion region. Uh, the diffusion region has itself, so this is the region right at the centre of the, of the reconnection where the action must happen, and, 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 but I don't think anybody really understands what that action is. And the, reason, the way to understand the diffusion region is that you get to a, a, a small enough scale that the ions which are gyrating around the magnetic field become chaotic, and so they decouple... Um, from the magnetic field. And so they start doing their own thing, while the electrons which are gyrate in a smaller uh, orbit stay connected to the magnetic field. And so what that sets up is a system of, of Hall currents through this ion diffusion region. So the green here are shown by currents that are carried by the electrons. Uh, and that sets up a, uh, a, a system of magnetic fields which we call the, the quadrupole magnetic fields, um, which... Uh, in this, in, in this diagram looks something like that. And then you get to where the real magic occurs at the electron diffusion region. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that we don't really yet understand what, how, how the physics of that supports the topology change. Um, and the reason for that is that the, if you look at the scale size of these things, that electron um, <coughs> diffusion region is probably something like only 25 kilometers across on a magnetosphere that is probably 50 uh, Earth radii across or more. Um, the ion demagnetization region is about a hundred, uh, about a thousand kilometres. Um, so that's possible to try to, to, to see that. And in fact, um, the cluster spacecraft uh, have in fact um, reported observations of this quadrupolar um, structure because the, the cluster separations have been on a scale that are appropriate for that. But more importantly, or more relevantly for the present time, then there, we, we currently have data coming in from um, what's called the, the Magnetospheric Multiscale, or MMS mission, which is four spacecraft which make very um, fast measurements 
on a separation scale which is of order 10 kilometers. And they do the fast measurements by effectively flying eight sets of particle de uh, detectors when um, only one would have been on a typical spacecraft before that. And just to say that um, the, 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 the expectation is, because we're looking for a needle in a haystack, that you might expect a few tens of, of encounters with this diffusion region. But one at least has been reported uh, early in the, in the mission in, in the original science paper. Uh, and what this uh, shows here, um, just briefly, is, is that the, these fast measurements of the magnetic field and the, and the plasma are such that you can now get into the diffusion region. The, 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 plasma, the, 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 the uh, spacecraft here is thought to have done something like that through the reconnected field wedge. But it crossed the jet first, and you can see uh, here where the, the, the jets that we've been talking about occur. But then it went through a reversal in the jet, which suggests it went through this, this region here. And you can see they're very fine-scale measurements of currents, uh, electric fields that, uh, in these, uh, these time series plots, which promise to, to, under, uh, to reveal what the, the, the underlying physics in these very small regions is. So that's something for the future, because... Uh, MMS is, is collecting and analysing data as we speak. Um, just to quickly um, round up, because uh, I wanted to try to link the talk to the discussion meeting that we had earlier, um, my original plan for reconnecting the heliosphere would have talked about uh, uh, the sun as well. Uh, and uh, so just to say that there are multiple um, uh, solar contexts in which reconnection is is. Uh, uh, invoked. Here is a model of, uh, of uh, eruptions, loop eruptions and flares that involves reconnection, cutting uh, underneath a loop and allowing it to, to eject. Here is a model that, I, that I've probably murdered by trying to draw it myself of, a, of what's called interchange reconnection, where um, plasma that's on, uh, trapped on a, on a closed field line is allowed to escape by reconnection with an, an open field line. And the reason why I showed these two was that I'm reminded that actually now, 10 years ago, more or less now, um, we produced this diagram, which was uh, supposed to show um, the connections between uh, the sun and things like coronal holes and filament eruptions and the heliosphere, which shows, in this case, the interchange reconnection that I showed you before and an eruption in, in, in CME. And I was led to, to, to connect that because today's discussion meeting was uh, about making the connection between uh, the sun and the heliosphere, and in particular, uh, some of these questions. Now, the reason why we were doing this 10 years ago was that we were proposing the instruments for the solar orbiter mission, which was being the subject of, of the meeting um, over the courtyard. Uh, and in fact, this proposal was successful, um, and we became one of 10 instruments that uh, were selected for this, for this mission. Uh, and although I'm only one instrument, I have uh, three sensors for which I am the principal investigator and that has been one of the big things um, for the last 10 years I feel like I've spent a lot of time investing I hope in my next 10 years of scientific achievement in answering um, questions about what reconnection and other processes do uh, in the heliosphere. Um, I'll skip that just to, to, to that was all, all the instruments just to show um, this is the state of, the, of, of where we are now this is my three flight sensors, and these are currently sitting in the clean room at MSSL, just waiting for formal um, permission by ESA and Airbus to deliver them. They're all ready to go. Uh, and perhaps I won't explain the, the principles. They're quite clever. We've uh, um, created a kind of a, an electrostatic periscope in order to be able to, to peer above the spacecraft heat shield. Um, but just to finish then, here is the the, the artist in, uh, latest artist impression of what we might look like. So here is Solar Orbiter staring at the, at the sun, and here are the three instruments that, that, that I've PI'd, one looking over this corner of the heat shield at the sun, one looking over this corner of the heat shield, and the, the, the third one that was actually built at MSSL sitting on the end of a boom uh, uh, at the back of the spacecraft uh, in shadow. Uh, and so with that, I've probably used slightly more, than, more time than I'm supposed to, so I'll just summarise and say... Um, if I'd been allowed to go on for another hour or so, I could have probably presented many more examples of reconnection, so I would argue that it's something of a ubiquitous pro process. Um, it's a small-scale process, um, but has global-scale consequences. Um, and because of that and the, and the, the, the role of the Dungy cycle, 
uh, it's something that's that's key to sort of coupling in in the sort of the chain of sun to mud um, of space weather and the the influence of the sun on the earth. Um, I briefly touched on the the fact that I think that it's quite an exciting time, certainly for the the kinetic physics in the diffusion region because of MMS, and hopefully, um, certainly as far as reconnection. Uh, and other processes in terms of the coupling of the Earth to the Sun. Um, I have a lot of time invested in Solar Orbiter that I hope will bear fruits in the next 10 years or so. So thank you for listening. Chris, thank you very much for delivering the uh, 2017 Dungy Lecture. So we have... Just a very brief time for maybe a couple of questions or comments. Um, hi, thanks for your great talk. So with regard to your question about Cassini, I've looked at the first 520 crossings of the magnetopause. Um, so from Saturn orbit insertion to roughly 2008, and that split half between dusk side and dawn side. And we didn't find anything that looked particularly convincing, but there were 26 candidates that sort of matched the magnetic signature, mm -hmm. and we kind of saw what you would expect. So of those 26 candidates, 22 were on the dusk side, and only four were on the dawn side. Um, and there was a significant bias to the north, but that might have been a seasonal effect because of the, the axial tilt there. So I'm not sure if that's particularly convincing, but it supports perhaps what you might expect. Yeah, that sounds reasonably promising to me. Now we're in trouble. Trevor, you know, let's go. You talked a lot about, uh, about the kind of global uh, aspects of reconnecting fields that are on kind of large scales. Uh, there's also a lot of interest in fine scale reconnection in turbulent regions and in other places as a mechanism, uh, perhaps for the ultimate kind of depositing point of the energy that's cascaded down from large scales. Yes, I think, I, so I'd rather rush through the, the, the little bit about the Kelvin-Helmholtz rolled up vortices, and, and, but I, I, it, I think that that's the kind of thing you're talking about where the field becomes more turbulent. And well, even in the magnetic sheets or somewhere that is, yeah. that is a really turbulent region, anywhere where you eventually generate fine-scale currents, you know, one way to dissipate them is, uh, is by reconnection. Okay, well, the clock is uh, moving ahead, so I'm afraid we must move on. So can we thank uh, Chris again very much?